Hi everybody. So welcome to our third uh, lockdown webinar, Assessing Movement Patterns. So just a few notes before we start. Um, as always, this webinar is being recorded, so we'll upload to the British Rail YouTube channel um, as soon as possible as we can afterwards. If you have any questions or comments as we go through the webinar, please use the question box you can find on the uh, on the comments side. Um, please note, however, there's a 15 to 30 second delay between us speaking and you hearing us. So there might be a bit, bit of delay coming back with you typing the question in, in and us seeing it as well. Um, we're also going to be doing some polls during the presentation tonight as well. So please make sure you, you look out for those and take part in those as they, as they come up. Um, and we've got a handout for this uh, webinar as well. So on your column to the right as well, you should hopefully see uh, one of, the, one of the boxes which says handout and there you'll be able to download um, the performance talent testing protocols which link uh, with the presentation tonight but if you if you're unable to download it there it's also available within the road development guide as well in the athleticism pillars um, so i think that's everything so lastly i'll introduce you to our speaker for tonight uh, rachel hooper who many of you i'm sure will know um, but she will be particularly well known in the Northwest as the head of rowing at the Grange School. She's one of our regional women's training day uh, lead coaches. She's also coaching commissioner, a dice tutor and a coach educator. So a long list of accolades to, uh, to her name. But I will now pass you over to Rachel. Thanks, James. Um, just checking you can see my um, my slides. So at the moment, Rachel, I think they've gone. They've gone, right? Let me yeah. just move it over to that. Are we on it? I'm going back. There you go. Right. Stuff. Excellent. Okay. Um, thank you all for um, joining us this evening. I think um, certainly as a coach educator, it's always really challenging to to find the time and for people to to engage in in CPD and opportunities to just come and and take the time to um, to learn some new things, to share some ideas. Um, and just think about the way that, that we're coaching, the way that we're, we're rowing. Uh, so it's a real, it's a, it's a forced opportunity. Um, and I think that um, hopefully you're finding, well, certainly the webinars that I've, I've attended so far have been really positive. Um, this evening's webinar is part of a two-part series for this week. So um, this evening is around assessing movement patterns. And then on Thursday, it will move on to, um, there's a physio called Stephen who will be coming on board and looking at, taking what you've you've assessed with your movement patterns and how you can look at your particularly your hip health uh, and and moving on and starting to, to to really work on getting the the gold standard of movement patterns and working on the areas that you need to develop um so before i start i just want to um say a big thank you to um some of the people who've helped contribute towards the presentation this evening um i sent out a a plea on Twitter for some um, guinea pigs to provide me with some some photos um, and some, some short video clips um, and and people were very forthcoming with that which is fantastic so thank you to the people and you will see yourselves throughout the presentation um, so a little bit of background um, the women's training days uh, have been happening across all the regions in the, in, the, um, in in England um, and yes they were de dedicated to time focus specifically on a, a specific gender a specific age group um but also it was an opportunity for them to um focus for coaches and athletes to have some dedicated time to really focus on specific movement patterns look at what those movement patterns look like um understanding any common errors around them and really understanding how to assess core movements as well for a good rowing stroke these are all things that we rarely in the midst of training and competition it's things that we talk about quite a lot potentially at the start of when we row um so when we're getting people into a boat when we're teaching them how to row but it's not necessarily something as coaches and athletes that we continually focus on um because we're starting to look at future goals so it's really kind of a back to basics and and now is an opportunity for us to as as coaches and as uh, and as athletes to really get back to basics and get back to some of those those things that are helping us to find those fundamental fundamental movement skills um that will ultimately help us to get into the right positions um in the boat and make boats go faster um so when james asked me to present this uh webinar um one of the biggest challenges was the days that we've we've been um delivering are a six hour practical day and i'm now obviously delivering this as a, a one hour 
non-practical day. So please do feel free at home. We're not watching you, so feel free to move around. Um, do what you want to. Um, this does link to the athleticism pillar within the, the Rower Development Guide, as James said. Um, and please do have a look at that if you haven't already done so. The, um, the webinar about the Rower Development Guide is available, available on YouTube as well. So if we look at um, the, the testing protocols and performance testing protocols, there's a number of areas that um, we look at and the, 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 um, the ones that we're looking at in particular this evening are the movement patterns and flexibility um, and in particular three movements. Um, they are available, as I say, to, within the Road Development Guide um, and it's about getting those basics right. So what we're going to look at this evening are the catch position, the hip hinge and the squat. Um, and we really, what, why do we want to look at those things? Well, it's we want to be able to get into the right positions to be able to transfer rower, rower power um, effectively in the boat. Um, and we also want to establish where you currently are. I know I'm speaking to a mix of coaches and athletes. So um, when I say you, it's either you as a coach or you supporting athletes. So as an athlete, um, you, can, you can look at it from that position as well. So it's really looking at what the gold standard looks like, what athletes, what positions should athletes be able to get themselves into um, and just establishing where they are as a picture of now. So we can then on uh, within Thursday's webinar, look at how you can start to improve those things as well. Um, so, in terms of the engagement, there are some multiple choice questions that we'll have throughout um, and also if um, there, there will be points where um, I'll be asking you for your feedback. Obviously, as a coach, there's certain ways that I explain things um, that have or haven't worked with certain athletes. Equally, there will be ways that you have explained things to your athletes. Um, that may or may not have worked for them as well. And as athletes, you may have had a, a coach say to you something that might have really struck a chord and, and helped you to understand uh, what we're talking about and how to get into the right positions. So I will be asking you to really input into what are the key phrases that really work for you. Um, and it's an opportunity for us to, to really share those things. So um, when we are teaching people to row, when we're, we're, we're learning to row, Typically, the things that we're thinking about, um, certainly the learn to row courses that I've observed, the learn to row courses that I've been in, in, involved in, it's how you hold on to your oar, how you put your oar in and out of the water, how you keep in time with the person in front of you, how you can stop yourself from flipping the boat over. And rarely do we actually talk about sitting. Um, rarely do we talk about how they sit in the boat, how you sit on a rowing machine. Um, you know, we, we do the typical hands, body, slide, get them on the rowing machine. But do we actually teach them how to sit, what their pelvis should be doing when they're sat on a rowing machine? So my first question to you um, this evening, and this is this is to, to everybody, um, it is, where are you sitting right now? Um, are you at a desk with an adjustable chair? Are you at a table with a non-adjustable chair? Are you in a sofa, bed or standing? That You might be somewhere else. Those are the options that we've got for this evening. So James, if I can ask you to put the poll up for me. And if you want to quickly click on what's what's uh, most appropriate for you. So we'll just give everybody a few seconds to 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 answer that. Uh, we've had 19% of people voted. Uh, so wait for that number to go up. People might just take a little while to, to see that come up. So we'll give everybody a few more seconds. That's good. We've got over 80. So I'm going to close that in three, two, one. Good stuff. So got a real mix there. I was at uh, so one point there was nobody in bed. We do have a few people in bed or on beds. <laughs> um, so there we go. There's the results. Um, so 12% standing. Interestingly, I did put this out as a poll on um, on Twitter as well, and a number of people said, no, I stand to work. Um, so um, that was what they were talking about. Can we bring that down, James? Brilliant, okay. Um, reason I asked the question, um, we're in really unique position at the moment, uh, really unique times. Um, in that our habits have changed in the last three weeks. Um, certainly mine have, certainly um, I know the, the athletes that I work with have, and, and really, it's something for us to be really conscious of as coaches and athletes. Pre-lockdown, our sitting habits were um, 
primarily um we would have travel um we would have you know to taking the car the train bus bike um we potentially have a good ergonomic desk setup in our office if working in an office regular movement breaks so particularly for school pupils as an example then move between classrooms um and there's there was the, just fewer options for for poor posture um so if we think about where we, where we were, it might feel like a lifetime ago for some people, but um, and where your athletes were, really what those changes have been in terms of um, how they sit and where they sit and what their sitting habits were. Um, so those are some of the things. There might have been a car, a lecture theatre. Equally for coaches, we've had a change in our in our sitting habits. We're not in a, on a on a launch sadly anymore. Uh, certainly not on bikes. Um, there, there will be people training on bikes, but I know that a lot of people have opted for, for staying inside and training on a static bike instead. So there really has been a change in habits. Um, and as a result of that change in habit, there's a change in posture as well. Um, so there's, there's a huge increase in screen time. I don't know if any of you get your reminders on your phone every week to say this is what your screen time is this week. Been quite, I was quite shocked last week at what mine had increased to, um, partly because I'd been uh, doing some work um, on, on my phone and um, doing a couple of media bits on my phone. Um, and, you know, massive increase in screen time, fewer breaks from sitting. Um, so certainly the um, pupils who are learning from home, juniors who are learning from home are on their screen and they're not going to be moving from desk, their desk. Um, and there's fewer, fewer suitable seating options. So I know that a lot of people that have gone from working in an office environment, which is a pretty good setup, they don't have that setup at home. So we're changing those seating options as well. Um, and there's potentially, well, certainly we're not in boats at the moment. Uh, so there's more static exercise happening. Um, so just think about the impact of that on, um, on, on us as athletes um, and, and on, um, on the athletes that we work with as coaches as well. So some of the postures that we're seeing, we're seeing people just sat with laptops on their beds, on their, you know, anywhere and everywhere we can, we can work and, uh, and study and um, just generally get our life admin done as well. Um, so there's been a big shift in that. Um, and there's, that means that we do have a, um, something to be really conscious of um, in terms of the impact of this. We don't know that how long we're going to be in this situation. Um, but um, it's something to be really aware of and how we're sitting is something we want to be aware of anyway but it's really really relevant right now because we've had a big change in, in sitting habits we've had a big shift in in um really what what we're doing on a daily basis um, and just our movements the general movements that we have to just keep well and active um, have you know decreased significantly so what can we do to make sure that we're, we're supporting ourselves um, on our athletes to be able to to keep on top of that so let's use this time wisely it's not an ideal opportunity but it is an opportunity to really get back to back to basics it could go one of which one of two ways um, you know, there are really small things that can make a difference in terms of your movement patterns. They're things that I know as a coach with my athletes are nagging them an awful lot to, to work on. Um, and it's people now have that extra time to work on them. So when we do get back out on the water, we want to be in a position where people have good posture and they've worked on it. They've been able to assess where they're at at the moment um, and they've been able to really look at it and, and work on the little things that they need to be working on. They've had the time to work on them as well. What we don't want is as a result of that, those change to seating habits is for people to get back into a boat and suffer injuries as a result of it. So let's really work on those, those small things. Um, next question for you. Um, and this is, we're not gonna, so while, whilst I'm talking, if you can type into the, the question section, um, which James will have a look at, is how do you explain to the people that you are coaching, and equally for any athletes listening in, how has a coach explained to you in a way that, that makes you understand how to sit well in a boat and how to sit well? So it might be something like sit up tall or think about your posture, sit on the bones of your bottom, imagine something, imagine, you know, there's a, a rod up your back. So just type in um, as and when you can, if you can type in there, we're going to feed back that, that shortly. Um, so I want us to think about how we're, we're teaching people how to sit. Um, so two of the things that we talk about are the, the tilt of your pelvis. Um, the first uh, picture on the left, picture A, is looking at an anterior tilt. 
And picture B is looking at a posterior tilt. Now, the easiest way to remember a posterior tilt is that you're sat on, you're more sat on your bottom and um, sat on the co more towards your coccyx, whereas an anterior tilt, tilt is sat up with that nice uh, rotation of your pelvis forwards. So, what I'd like you to do, I know some of you are sat on a bed or sat on a sofa, so it might be a bit more tricky to do. If you want to sit on the floor to do it, it might be a bit more handy. Um, Try rotating your pelvis. So think about looking at this picture and just think about rotating your pelvis forwards and backwards and see what it does. A to your posture. So I'm doing it now so you can see me. It's affecting my shoulders, um, and my lumbar spine, and my, and my, my position as well. So just have a look at how it affects you if you have that rotation in your pelvis. That's an awful lot of what we're going to focus on this evening is really the, what that pelvic position is. And something as coaches that's quite tricky for get to get us athletes to understand is the difference between their pelvis their spine their hips their bum their thighs how it all fits together but really let's think about that pelvic situation think about that that rotation in it and what difference does it make in terms of engagement of either abdominal muscles hip flexors core muscles as well so if you're just continually rotating it um what what do you feel how does it feel and, and do we actually get our athletes to do this at the moment is that something that you've, you've tried with your athletes you get them to understand um it should be something that we, we should be really focusing on before we've got them in a boat before we've done the hands body slide is sit them down and get them to understand the position that they need to be sat in for a good um rowing stroke so that the the good anterior flexion flexion of their um their pelvis so not too much, um, but so then sat in a nice, comfortable position. As I say, this is the kind of gold standard for some of them and, and for people who are growing, for maybe for some masters athletes as well. Um, they may struggle to get into these positions. Um, it's partly down to making sure we're in the right position, but also being able to, to, to hold a position when we're, um, when we're putting it under pressure so, and, and loading it. So um, just thinking about you know, how we can assess your sitting position. Um, equally, on this slide here, we're showing just different uh, sitting positions off backstop, so slight lean back, uh, sitting up nice and straight, and a slight rock forwards as well. So just as, in terms of supporting your athletes to start off with, and not just when you're teaching them to row, um, this is something that we should do, you know, if they're struggling, um, just spend some time doing it. Um, Equally, now you, you might not have an ergo at home, um, but if we can get them to literally sit on the floor, legs in front of them, um, or sit on a chair, feet flat on the floor, and take some pictures of themselves, and what position do they naturally sit in, and what position feels comfortable for them to row in as well? Um, and they can look at that themselves, and you can help them to look at them, look, help them to look at that as well as coaches. Um, so while sit, assessing your actual sitting position isn't part of the testing protocols, it's a really useful starting point. Um, so um, in terms of assessing the catch position, um, the, the reason we want to do it was we want to monitor the rowing specific hip flexion and mobility. So if we look at what good looks like and what standard deviations look like, and then look at assessing yourself or as a, if you're a coach, looking at assessing your athletes as well, how you can do that. Um, so question number two for you is, why is the correct catch position important? Is it to avoid injury? Is it to ensure power can be applied effectively? Or is it to ensure a good straight length? So um, James is just going to pop another poll up for you. It's, you can have more than one answer if you want to. So just give you a minute to do that. So while everybody's taking an opportunity to answer that question, Rachel, we've been having uh, loads of comments coming in about the... Um, the uh, the way people uh, talk about uh, how they describe the the cat position there. Do you want to have them after this poll or? Yeah, if people are talking, yeah, if we can have some just some feedback on how people are commenting, uh, coaching how to sit or how they're being coached how to sit, that'd be really useful if you want to feed that back. Yeah, so should we do that after we finish this poll? We've got about 65% of the uh, viewers voting at the moment. so. Yep. We'll just wait till it goes over 80 and then we'll close that poll. So I'll give everybody a few more seconds. Three, two, one, and I'll close it there. And then we'll bring up the, the results. Okie doke. So 98% on ensuring power can be applied effectively. Absolutely. Avoiding injury. 
a hundred percent um the the uh if we've got the pelvic tilt right and and got um the sitting position right we can get into the right positions to be able to apply power effectively through the right parts of the body um and avoid injury as well and, and avoid and and help to load up the body effectively it well we've only got 60 percent 67 percent have said to ensure a good stroke length whilst that isn't the priority it is one of the benefits um of of making sure that we've got that so um being able to really get into a good catch position will help to make sure that we've got the longest stroke possible um within that as well so thanks for that james so if you just want to come up and um feedback some of the things that we've got through in terms of um people talking about yeah. how to coach how to sit so some of the comments we've got so thinking about sitting up tall engaging your core a lot um a couple of people uh mentioned either being pulled up by your hair or having a string attached to your spine and being pulled up as well um thinking about your posture so think about the posture assuming uh you've already explained that to them uh one i quite like that i saw so think meerkat not squirrel um I think that's potentially a good way to think about it. I quite like that. I'm quite easy to think about. Right now. <laughs> um, we've got things like, uh, as you've mentioned, practicing at home, rooted on the sitting bones, then doing happy cat, sad cat to think about moving your pelvic position um, as well. Uh, so yeah, lot, lots of um, really good comments coming in there. Do you want any more? No, that's fantastic. So um, the sad cat, happy cat one, equally, that's whilst that's not sat in, sitting down, that's a real emphasis of um, that rotation um, and, and thinking about how we can move that pelvis um, in different ways and in different positions. So moving from horizontal, vertical, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, um, fantastic. Thanks for all that feedback. Um, so catch position assessment, um, we do do it on the ergo. Um, now, for some people at, right now, it might be a while before they can get back on an ergo. Uh, one thing I have seen is somebody stack up a nice stack of cookery books um, in their kitchen and then have a tray rested up against the wall um, as a foot plate and just testing, seeing what position they can get into and, and uh, looking at their pelvic position in that position. So, you know, whilst your athletes might come back and say, oh, sorry, I can't send you a picture of myself on an ergo. Uh, so it's a make do and mend opportunity at the moment. So um, we want them to um, move into the catch position or as fully forward as they possibly can and, and hold that position with no assistance. Um, so for coaches working remotely at the moment, this is an opportunity for you to get these, these, these bits of information and really get quite literally capture a picture of where your athlete is at. So somebody can take a picture of them um, and you can look at that um, and what, feel, what feels comfortable for them and give them that feedback on their, their um, catch position as well. Equally, if you're not in contact with your athletes at the moment, they might want to do that within their peer groups um, and look at each other. Or as an athlete, you might just want to look at that picture yourself if you're able to. Um, so normal catch position, uh, what are we looking working towards? Um, there's two things we need to be looking at. One is the rotation of the pelvis and one is the lumbar spine and the core strength. So lumbar spine, um, obviously, is this, this part of the spine, which I'm looking at with my mouse at the moment. And the rotation of the pelvis is around this area, around the glutes area, and just really how we're doing this. So thank you for my, my model here on this water over in the sunshine. Um, so when we talk about anterior and posterior tilt, if you think back to that earlier picture, um, and think about the uh, posterior tilt that we talked about, which is the sitting on your coccyx, uh, and the anterior tilt, which is tilting it nice and forwards. So here we've got, yes, it's not perfect. Sorry, Martin. Um, <laughs> but it is in a good, good, strong position for a catch. So we've got a good anterior tilt of the pelvis, and we've got good lumbar core strength position as well. So if we were to push straight off the foot plate there, um, if we're able to load it, and, and one of the key messages again, even if that's even if that um, rotation of the pelvis was slightly under and slightly more posterior, if we're able to hold the load and hold the load for multiple strokes, then that's that's the key. And so um, if we were to push back off that position and, and that form was to be lost, um, then obviously it's not as strong as position as it looks, but um, we want to make sure that um, people are able to hold that position under load. So this, if we work through um, just some of the areas here, sorry, just move on that. Um, so deviations from it. So if I just flip between the slides here, 
you'll be able to see there's a slight rotation of the pelvis here. So we're going slight rotation of the pelvis. It's not going into a slight posterior position, um, but there is some anterior tilt of it. Um, and then there's a slight curve of the lumbar spine as well. One thing to notice between these two is the body position. So if you look at it, the body position, it's coming backwards. So we're not getting that rock forward. People always talk about body lean. So uh, we're losing that body lean um, that we're getting as a result of the pelvic position. Um, equally, this next one was getting a lot more tilt towards the back um, and, and a lot more backward posterior tilt, tilt of the pelvis. And there's quite an obvious, an obvious tilt in the um, and curve in the lumbar spine as well. Um, and these, these are some of the key deviations. And then equally, it gets significantly um, trickier. And this is the position I, I regularly see juniors sitting in on an ergo um, because they really struggle to get into anything other than this position. Um, that's why sitting on an ergo in this position is, is not, um, if you, you've listened to back to what Shep was saying um, on the Road Development Guide um, webinar about, you know, we want to be using ergos for technique. If we've got somebody sat rowing like this on, a on an ergo, actually we need to get them off the ergo um, and get them sitting properly um, and learning to sit and, and working on their, their hip health to be able to sit properly and effectively on an ergo um, because that's going to do them some damage otherwise. Um, so again, just thinking about that, if we go between the slides, um, just looking at those deviations between the, um, the, the body position and the rocking of the pelvis as well. Um, so question for you, hopefully that all makes sense in terms of the anterior and the posterior rock. So the anterior rock of the pelvis is when it's rocked forwards, and we're into that nice rocking over position, it's a good nice strong position. Posterior deviation is when it starts to rock backwards and we're really starting to see that curving under and a sitting, sitting on our bottom rather than on, on our hips. Okay, so question, where's my mouse gone there? Between these two pictures, uh, which picture shows an anterior pelvic tilt? So think about the things we talked about, which was the body position. Um, think about the position of the pelvis as well. Um, we have a look at that. And then, James, can you pop the poll up for me? So just to note for everybody, because um, we didn't explain this fully when we put the first two polls up, you can click on the screen and click your answer on the screen. Oh, wow, the technology is amazing. <laughs> I think that's how it works anyway. I think that's what I did the other day. Uh, so we're, we're just collecting responses now. So that number's going up. Just over 50% answered so far. We'll give everybody a few more seconds there. So three, two, one, close and share those results. Fantastic. Okay, so 90%. Overwhelming result there, I say, on the 90%. Uh, the 10% the that are on B, um, completely understand why you said that, because it is a tricky thing to observe sometimes. Um, James, can you just drag that off the screen? Yeah. Brilliant, thank you. Um, it is tricky to, to see, but if we look at particularly the body position uh, in relation to uh, where the body is on the thighs, um, you can see there um, on the on picture B, um, it's quite far back, uh, and on picture A, we've got that nice. Um, it's a bit trickier on picture A because she's wearing quite a dark all-in-one, um, so you can't see against the dark background as well. And these are all coaching points that are always quite tricky to do. So when you're assessing yourself, when you're taking this picture, nice, you know, make sure that you've got the contrast between your kit and and the background as well, um, and it'll be a lot easier to to see. Okay, so if we move on to um, the next picture. So which one's showing a posterior pelvic tilt? So again, thinking about um, that dragging the, the posterior under, so dragging the coccyx down and, and really um, tilting that, that pelvis underneath. So which one's showing the, that posterior pelvic tilt? Um, again, can we bring a poll up, James? So response is coming in nice and quick now. Fingers on buzzers. <laughs> okay. 
So everybody's getting much quicker on the responses now, so this is good. Yeah. Uh, just over 80%, so I'll give you three more seconds. Three, two, one. Okay, so got 80% on, 87% on B, that's right. So again, it is tricky to see, and if you've got somebody who's out in a boat, um, you're not necessarily going to be able to see it um, particularly well, uh, and it may be that they're, they're struggling to get into different positions, or it may be that their body's opening up a bit sooner than you wanted it to, but think about that pelvic position all the time, um, and on what position you want that person that person to be sitting in, and how they're sitting, and just reset as and when uh, as when you can. Um, so, um, can we just drag that pole down, James? Brilliant. So, um, yeah, just thinking about that that pelvic position and that pelvic tilt all the time uh, will really help you to understand um, and and help your athlete to understand how they can get into the right best position for them um, and something that um, shows us quite well is the next slide so um, this person's obviously not been feeding themselves very well but this uh, thanks to purse for this photo i think it illustrates quite often we're thinking about the muscles quite often we're thinking about a, a whole body and actually if we can think about it from a skeletal point of view um, and, and really engage um, athletes in understanding what the skeleton's doing throughout the rowing stroke yes it's going to be very difficult for this this anybody to get into this exact position um, but if you look at where um, the hip bones are in relation to the thighs um, and look at where the coccyx is as well and look at the lumbar spine and there's no bend in that um, so really making them think about um, about how their their skeleton is working on the rowing stroke as well. Um, equally, the impact of the pelvic tilt on the body position. I think between these three photos, you can really see the difference. Um, and if you're assessing yourself, um, or if your coach is assessing you with the pictures that you're taking, um, it will really help you to see in terms of where your body position is in relation to your thighs, what your um, what your pelvic tilt's doing as well at the same time. So just in terms of actually assessing your catch position, um, this is uh, this little table is within the um, rower development guide, um, and you know, you can score yourself one to five um, at, at where you are at the moment. So again, looking at that rotation of the pelvis and looking at the lumbar and, and spine core strength. Equally, depending on what position you're able to get into, what happens to that position when it's under load? Does it change when it's under load? So are you able to get into a nice position and then as soon as you take a stroke, as soon as you push through the, through your feet, uh, does, that, does that load change? Um, so looking at that as well. Um, so James, any other feedback at the moment that's come through? Just before I move on to the next. Uh, so we've had some uh, questions come in, if you want me to bring up some of those questions. Yep. Yep. So um, somebody asked, should the anterior tilt become a posterior tilt by the end of the stroke? No. <laughs> It's so it's whilst it is um, because if you think about the um, the position of the lumbar spine, so we want that position of the lumbar spine to stay the same. Uh, we, we don't want any bend in the lumbar spine. Um, and as soon as you get the posterior tilt in your um, in your pelvis, it's, it's difficult to explain actually, isn't it? Um, but it's, you you want that that anterior tilt to be coming through, and then it it remains. But it's it, whilst it's a posterior tilt in um technically speaking but we haven't got the curve underneath so the seat's not coming underneath so we want it to stay um we want the lumbar spine to be staying in a, in a nice position through that okay and uh one of the other questions that's come in if somebody has very tight hamstrings so the posterior position should uh should we stop them rowing full slide should we stop them rowing full slide if they've got tight hamstrings um it depends what positions they're so it's it, it depends what positions they're struggling to get into um the main thing is that we don't want people to um be sustaining an injury as a result of of really poor posture and part of that is what they can sustain in terms of loading up the stroke as well um so a lot of this will come into the discussions that are um Stephen will talk you through on on thursday um in terms of individual um some of some of the key sort of issues that we come across within uh within 
pelvic um, positioning uh, and one of those is massively is flexibility um, because people are struggling to get their pelvis into that position so that will come on with what Stephen will be talking on on Thursday it's not about stopping them rowing but it's about helping them to, to get them in the right position it might just be taking it really really slowly and looking at other training to help them to get into the right positions instead any other ones James or are you happy to move on to the next um, so there's a, there's a couple of com comments about the heel position um, and being uh, as low as possible, I think you mentioned. Um, would that make the drive, uh, would that make the drive leverage more inefficient? Make the drive what, sorry? The, the leverage of the stroke more inefficient. More inefficient? Yeah. So Wait, if you've got your heels low yeah in the boat would that change the efficiency efficiency of your stroke at all so in terms of what would to in terms of the testing protocol obviously it's we know that it's an art and a science this um with between everything and, and getting the the feet position right in the boat and, and on the ergo as well so this is about assessing particular catch positions so we want to see what positions people can get into um on an ergo um within this this position uh, within this um, the testing protocols that we've got here so um, in terms of what's the right height for them to be in in the boat um, we want it to be the most effective position for them so they can get those heels down um, but for the for the for the purposes of this actual test it is that we can, should have them as low as possible that is that works for them just to see what positions they can get into um, and then we then we start adjusting it and looking at it and training around it as well Okay. Brilliant. I'll, I'll leave the questioning for the for there at the moment, Rachel. I'll let you get on with the presentation. Okay, fantastic. Thanks, James. Okay, so moving on to the next one, which is the hip hinge test. Now, this is something that um, potentially um, some athletes haven't done before. Um, it's it's quite a basic test, but it is a really useful one. Um, it's testing the movement of the rock over and, and whether it can be achieved effectively or not. Um, so this um, picture is showing the position that we want people to be moving into. Why is it important? So, so next question, question number three. Um, so why is the hip hinge important? To, is, is it to ensure that your core is correctly engaged? to make sure that you're using your six pack, to make sure that you've got an effective application of power on the water, or to ensure effective application of power in the gym. So uh, we can have that poll, those questions come up. Okay, so we've got some responses coming in. I think people just taking their time to to, to read that uh, question in the answer to make sure they're giving the correct the, the answer they want. Coming in thick and fast, thank you. Okay, so we'll just give people a few more seconds. Three, two, one. Thank you. So close there and share the responses. Okay, great. So funnily enough, I did have this discussion with um, somebody this morning. They were saying, actually, yes, it's about application of the power on the water, application of power in the gym. Is it about core? Is hip hinge about core? Actually, yes, if we're not engaging the core as well, then we can't get an effective, um, we can't engage our, our hips properly and our, get our hip hinge correct as well. Six pack is not something that we're, we're talking about in terms of hip hinge, uh, but again, it's, it's whether or not we're using, um, it's getting that differentiation between core and, um, and abdominals as well. Um, so yes, we, it's, it's all of the above really, uh, apart from the use of the six pack. Um, particularly that that effective use of an application of power on the water and the hip hinge is huge in some of the movements that we do in the gym as well depending on mm -hmm. on what athletes you're working with and what work gym work you're doing with them there's some key movements that we do in the gym as part of an snc program uh, that really rely on an, an effective hip hinge as well so if we're not getting it right then we're not going to get the benefits of what we're doing in the gym as well so what does good look like um, in terms of a hip hinge uh, again, feel free to have a go at this and get up off your feet if you want to um, whilst you're um, at home. 
Um, so feet shoulder width apart and toes pointing slightly outwards. Body should remain straight with a neutral spine, uh, which I'll show you shortly. Um, and shoulder blades should be retracted and chest open. Um, knees need to be slightly bent. Most people uh, would say it says might, may be slightly bent, but it's helpful for them to be slightly bent. Uh, and rocking over from the hips until we're 90 degrees or until the upper body is parallel with the floor. Um, hips should move backwards whilst maintaining the same angle at the knees. Um, so I hope for a few, hopefully a few of you are trying that at home. Um, some of the coaching points that we might use to explain the hip hinge or rocking over from your hips or pivot from your hips. Um, again, those are things that are the, the classic things that, that coaches are, are talking about. But again, if we can think about the pelvis rather than just the hips uh, and thinking again about that position of the pelvis. Um, so one little um, thing that we can use to, to really test our hip hinge um, is um, and I'd, I'd suggest if you can have a go at trying this is, uh, um, at home if you want to, is um, putting your um, fingers on your lower spine. Um, and the first, this is a, a quick video, it'll be a little bit jolty, but it should be okay. Um, and the first two times um, bending over, you'll see there's no movement in the clothes and the fingers stay, to, stay at the same distance. And then the second time, which is when we have a lumbar bend, the, you'll see the fingers move apart and the, uh, the clothing moves significantly as well. So the first time that's a hip hinge. So fingers staying the same distance apart. And then we try the lumbar bend. So you can see that's coming from the lumbar spine rather than from the hips. You see there's an awful lot of movement on the clothes and the fingers are moving apart as well. So we go to the hip hinge again. So that's a really simple way for people to understand the difference between bending from their hips and hinging from their hips and bending from their lower back. Um, and they'll be able to feel their fingers moving apart um, if they're bending from their lower back rather than their, um, their hips. And equally, if you can get somebody to video you, um, you can see what's happening. That this uh, uh, It's got quite, a, quite loose clothing on. You can see what's happening with the creases in the clothing as well. If the clothing's moving, then we're using our back rather than our hips. Um, so as a starting point for a hip hinge, we want to make sure this is a really nice neutral spine here. Shoulder blades are retracted and chest open. So um, the chest position is just as important as the, the, the pelvis position with this. Uh, we want to make sure that those shoulders are nice and retracted. Um, and then some standard deviations um, with hip hinging. Um, and you'll see this again, it comes down to um, that pelvic rotation. Um, so whilst it uh, it looks like there's some, some upper body movement, actually, if you look at the difference between the left and the right picture, um, you'll see that um, the pelvis is tilted under as well. So the second picture, we've got that posterior pelvic tilt um, and we're not able to get quite as good a hinge over and we're not able to, the chests move towards, forwards as well. So a coaching point is that we can use um, uh, broom handle if you want to and look at the points so it should be touching between the shoulders and uh, on the glutes on the on the top of the pelvis as well um, and if it's not able to touch one if it's touching one or the other um, then we've got a bend in in, uh, in an, um, through the through the lumbar spine uh, or through the thoracic spine so think about that pelvis uh, and that pelvic tilt when we're looking at doing this hip hinge as well Again, we're looking at the gold standard. We're looking at assessing what positions people can get into. We're not looking at currently uh, at what we're doing to improve them. We're looking at assessing them. So what should we be looking for in terms of <coughs> what does good look like um, and how we can make sure we've got that. So in terms of the actual assessment, um, we want to take the assessment in terms of taking pictures from the side, um, head, shoulders um, remaining in place. Um, so we don't want the head leaning back, we don't want it coming down and the chin coming down, um, lumbar spine, spine remaining straight um, and the pelvis and lumbar spine re remaining aligned as well um, and reaching that 90 degrees position. So seeing what positions you can get into. One of the great things about at the moment, if you've got somebody that can take, you, take pictures of you in these positions, is that you can get them up on your computer screen if you like, draw pictures and lines on them. 
and see what lines are happening. So um, if your athletes can do that and feed that back to you or just look at it and assess themselves as well, uh, it's a really useful thing to do. And, and a lot of the, the athletes that have come on the women's training days have said, oh, I've never taken pictures of myself doing it. I've never, never taken any picture of myself in the gym, never taken a video of myself in the gym doing any movements whatsoever, whether it's conditioning or lifting weights or anything. And really, we, we're, we're very good at, at taking video on the water, but these classic movements are something that you can really start to look at. And particularly now we've got the opportunity, a little bit more time to, to look at these things at home. No equipment required for this particular test in particular. Um, so that's that's the hip hinge side of things. It's very simple, um, but it's about getting it right. So um, James, have you had any more feedback from people on in terms of how they're they're coaching the hip hinge for people? Mm -hmm. So we've only had a, a, a couple of comments on this one, um, but somebody suggested instead of using the fingers, they put they've trialled putting tape on that area um, uh -huh. to see uh, the stretch on the tape or if yeah, the tape moves. Um, so I've got a couple more comments coming in now. Um, for the, the, there's a question. I'll come back to that one in a second. Um, Uh, I'm just reading one of the comments, it's a bit longer. Um, so, uh, one of the questions, probably more of a safeguarding one, is how do you reconcile safeguarding with taking pictures of kids? That's probably uh, an important one to sort of think about. Okay. Um, so one of those ones would be they're taking pictures, if they're at home and their mum or dad or whatever, siblings are taking pictures of themselves, um, then that's absolutely fine. It's, it's it's just the same as if you were um, videoing them on the water. If they've if they've and if they're showing them to you on their own devices, um, then that's different to them sending to you them do on personal devices. So it, be aware of the safeguarding um, if you are within. Depending what IT system you've got uh, for sharing things like this. Um, it's it's different for everybody. So some people will have systems where you can share. Um, share footage and, and share documents um, and, and coach right like that. But uh, yes, it's something to be very aware of. Absolutely. And uh, uh, another couple of comments come in. So somebody suggested uh, on hip hinge, bringing the hips, bring the shoulders over. Uh, so that's just a, a comment they make on how, how to coach that as well. Um, somebody has suggested holding the rib cage up as you reach forwards to encourage the extension in the reach as well. Um, uh, somebody else has mentioned as well, so best cue for the hip pinch, stand a few inches in front of a wall, bend the knees slightly, then tell the athlete to push their bum back up until it hits the wall, uh, so they will feel the movement in the hamstrings. Once they can feel the movement pattern, ask them to move forward a couple of inches and repeat. Absolutely. Use of walls with, with both hip hinges and squatting are really useful, um, depending on, on how people are get, getting along with, with um, doing the movement. Um, so in terms of assessing the movement, they might they may struggle to do that. Certainly, we had a couple of athletes on my one of my training days that they really struggled to get into the position, and we did use the wall uh, with them to 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 just get a gauge of something to to focus on as well for them. Um, some really useful coaching points there, and, and yeah, absolutely um, in terms of photos or video footage of juniors in particular, it, it does depend on what system that you've got in terms of um, what sort of coaching environment you, you're working within in terms of sharing pictures, particularly right now. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so we want to make sure that they're just staying within the, the realms of, of um, the right right policies and procedures on that. But Again, they can assess themselves and getting them to draw draw the lines on themselves. You know, you may want to use um, some some pictures and of um, athletes that are available to you online. Um, equally, this um, this uh, webinar will be available online. So if you wanted to show them some of the pictures in terms of giving them an idea of what positions they should be getting themselves in and what they should be looking for, then you can use that as well. So, uh, just conscious of time, uh, going to move into the squat assessment. So, um, we want to assess the ability of a rower to achieve the positions um, required to row powerfully and safely on an ergo or in a boat. Um, reason I've put this picture here, um, if you have a toddler, um, watch them squat. They're absolute experts at it. Um, and they... Um, we, we lose this as we start to grow, um, but toddlers are 
<laughs> brilliant at squatting. They're brilliant at keeping their heels on the floor, getting really, really deep squat uh, and keeping their balance most of the time as well. So if you think about that, the, the, the points that we've got there, they're looking straight ahead, the chest is up, knees tracking over their toes, uh, feet shoulder width apart, weight in heels, hips above the knee, uh, below the, the top of the knee, sorry, uh, they've got maintaining that lumbar curve and their shoulders are back. So squatting, whilst it is a lower body exercise, what your chest is doing is very important as well within it. So um, it, just a question, number, another question for you. Um, what, why is a good squat important for rowing? So is it to ensure the rower's got strong legs? Is it to ensure they have a good connection through the foot plate? Or is it because rowing's a leg sport? So I'll give you a couple of minutes to do that one. We've just got over just over 20% of the people voting at the moment. So that number's quickly rising up. See, so last question for the evening, I promise, I think. <laughs> uh, everybody's still lagging from the long weekend, I think. Yeah. So getting people's Absolutely. brains back engaged. So this is good. We've got a great percent now. So we're going to close in three, yep. two, one. Okay, so the primary one is definitely ensuring we've got a good connection through the foot plate. If we're able to squat well through the floor, somebody told me a while ago, uh, years ago, it was a coach, can't remember, I think it might have been thrust, said, you know, squat, rowing's just squatting horizontally, uh, we're going on a, on a moving seat. So um, if we're able to, to get a good squat, squat movement and good squat positions, um, then we're able to get that, that good connection through the foot plate as well. Um, equally, the, the two either side of that, so to ensure the row's got strong legs and because rowing's a leg sport, if we're able to squat well, then we're able to get really good benefit from A, from the rowing stroke and the connection of power in the rowing stroke and equally any squatting work in the gym, whether it's conditioning wise or, um, or strength wise. Uh, using weights, then if we've got a good strength, squat movement, uh, then those will be much more effective and people will benefit much more effectively from the, from the movement patterns they've got um, in the gym as well. So if we can just take that poll down for me, James. So what are we looking for in a, in a good squat? So thanks for Lucy for coming forward to volunteering for this. So we want to make sure that your feet, um, and again, it's, it's relating to the, yes, this athlete's not a toddler, um, but we can see the lines that I've drawn on here uh, in terms of the spine position, the thigh position, and the, uh, the lower leg position as well, the knee position. Feet should be shoulder width apart. Again, if you're at home and you want to try this, you're more than welcome to. Uh, body position. Now, this is something that, that um, is linked partly to flexibility and control as well. If that body starts to fall forwards, then we're, we're not going to be in an effective position, particularly if we're trying to lift weights off the top of it as well. Um, should be upright, shoulder blades retracted and chest open, so that nice to open chest position, pushing your hips back and descend by flexing the hips and the knees. Uh, maintain that neutral curve in the spine and that open chest too. Keep the heels on the floor, which is the classic one, which often people will have their heels raised up off the floor when they're squatting. Um, and um, flex the knees and hips until the thighs are parallel to the floor. So nice, nice picture of a good squat there. Um, again, this is it from a slightly different angle. When you're assessing yourself or getting your athletes to assess themselves, we can take these pictures. Squatting in particular is really used from, from back, side and front because uh, they can see different what they're different, doing differently and deviating differently or doing well. Um, so again, the, the lines that I've put, put on here, uh, we can see um, that nice knees aligned with the toes as well. Um, so quick last question, um, any coaching points uh, or any key phrases? So some of the coaching points might be push your heels through the floor, hips back and flex the knees. Uh, so if you wanna put any comments in the, in the questions box, please, please do. Um, so I've just got a couple of videos for us to look at. Um, and if we look at this first one, so it will be slightly disjointed. So really thinking through that movement pattern. 
looking at what the hips are doing, moving back, thinking about what the heels are doing. So obviously this is a master's rower. Don't mind me saying that. Um, but nice movement, thinking about the basics, getting the basics right in terms of getting that squat right. So if we look at the deviations, um, so some of those that we might see are heels lifting up off the floor. And in particular, if you look at what's happening to the chest on this one, where's my mask on? Um, so the chest is, is um, collapsing forward slightly, which again, if we link it back to the first point that we were talking about, which is that pelvic rotation, if we look at what the pelvis is doing, the pelvis rotating forwards on, as, we, as we start to squat down, um, then that's where we're starting to lose that position a little bit as well. So those are some of the, the disjointed. This is another classic one, the knock knees. Um, so again, this is something that um, Stephen will be talking about on Thursday, talking about why we do this, why it's an issue and, and how we can start to rectify it, um, just in terms of the weaknesses that we're getting. But if you think about that, and, and link it back to the previous picture that I showed you in terms of the, the knees aligning with the feet. Just think about how they can align, I know he's overemphasizing the point there, um, and to make sure that we've got those, avoiding those knock knees coming through. Um, again, just a position here from the side, um, being able to see that those heels are coming up off the floor um, and um, the knees and toes aren't aligned either. So on this one, uh, the knees are actually starting to come outwards. Um, as the heels are coming up off the floor. So, um, in terms of assessing a squat, what we want to see is head and shoulders in the same place. So we can assess getting into that squat position, but equally we want to assess um, how we're moving through that squat position as well. So what, what position is the chest staying in? What position are the thighs getting into? And what position is that pelvic rotation in as well? Um, lumbar spine should be staying in a normal, normal curve. So keeping it nice and natural um, in terms of not, not, um, not overemphasizing a, a curve, either posterior or anterior. Um, and thighs must remain in a parallel position once we're getting into that position as well. Heels remaining on the floor. So, when, when you're assessing yourself or when your athletes are assessing themselves, um, then um, th those are the, the things that are key points that we want to be assessing and looking at. And where we start to deviate from it, is that is where we start to then put the training points in place to start to improve on those things. So um, Jay James, any feedback in terms of coaching the squat that's come through? Uh, yeah, so we've got a, a fair few. So, um... So somebody suggests lower as if sitting down into a comfy chair. That's one that I've definitely used in the past. So thinking as you go back, as you, as you sit down into a chair, you're actually going back a little bit. Um, the, somebody else suggests pushing through the heels and keeping look at it and keep looking forward, not down as well. So make sure your eyes keep uh, looking off the horizon. Um, so make sure you push through the floor or foot stretcher, bum and bar should be uh, moving together at the same speed as well. So there's a, a few comments. Good selection there. So part of that is, part of those comments are related to the, the movement of actually completing a whole squat movement. Um, but think about it as well as in, into physically getting into that squat position that, that this athlete's in right now. So, um, you know, there's, there's, there's two movement, there's two parts of it. It's getting into the position um, that the athlete's in, in terms of assessing, are you able to physically get into that position? Again, relating back to what we were talking about earlier with the catch position, and then starting to look at the movement out through that and through into a squat, position, squat movement as well. Um, so really, um, it's just, a, there's been a real whistle stop tour and really appreciate your engagement this evening, um, just conscious of the time. So the things that we need to look at in terms of assessing movement patterns, um, camera phone, um, looking at it, um, look at using the different uh, methods of that. So video, photo, and particularly with the squat movement is the slow-mo feature on a, on a phone. If you can um, do a slow-mo of somebody squatting, yourself squatting, front, side, and back, it will really start, you'll re be able to start to really pick out um, what's going well and what's where there are uh, deviations from the gold standard as well. 
and equally athletes using your coach they are an assessment tool as well it's really challenging at the moment uh, for a lot of coaches to actually be in touch with their their athletes because obviously we're not with them um so do use this um obviously within the realms of of making sure we're, we're um looking at from a safeguarding point of view in terms of sharing photos and things digitally um but um do be aware of, of, of how people can assess themselves um, and if they, they're able to identify, I encourage you to um, get your athletes not necessarily to sit down and watch the whole hour of this presentation, but to watch the specific parts of it that are relevant to what you're trying to support them with. Um, we've got about one minute left, so I don't know if anybody will have any questions, but um, just as a quick summary, do use this time and encourage your athletes to use this time off the water to assess what their current movement patterns are. Um, the webinar on Thursday will link off the back of this completely to identify particularly good hip health um, and just keep thinking about where you're sitting and how you're sitting during lockdown. That's coaches as well as athletes um, because certainly we're all getting a few twinges here and there. So really appreciate your engagement this evening. Uh, it's been fantastic and um, thank you very much and look forward to seeing you on Thursday. Okay, Rachel, so we do have a couple of questions coming in. Uh, yep. So the first one I'll ask is, if, if uh, an athlete can't squat without lifting their heels off the ground, is there any advice to assist with that? Yeah, so uh, depending on how far their heels are coming off the ground, some of the, some certainly I have this problem as an athlete, um, is in terms of ankle flexibility. If you can find them um, something to wedge underneath the, the hit their heels, um, I often find the little five kilo um, weights discs are always quite useful. Um, and that can sometimes, that's that's obviously, uh, can be a really quick way to rectify that problem with their, their lifting their heels off the floor. If they're still doing that, then there might be an, a more of an underlying issue in terms of their, their heel flexibility, their ankle flexibility. Um, but yeah, just something which is like a centimetre um, that will help them. Uh, weightlifting sh shoes can help, but I wouldn't say to tell all your athletes that they've got to wear weightlifting shoes because they don't have to. Uh, equally, within the boat, some, sometimes athletes will need a wedge in the boat as well to, to support them with that as well, depending on their flexibility. Okay, uh, another question we have is, so the squat pictures we've been showing show the hands out in front and the hands are behind uh, the head on the assessment sheet. Um, yes. So is there, it, what, which one would you uh, specifically say? Right, so, so for the assessment, uh, we'd like people to assess them with their hands behind their head please. Uh, there was another question earlier. So, uh, my athletes have no problem with a low squat, heels down and knees behind their toes, but they struggle with the chest up. Help. They struggle with the chest up? Yeah. Okay. Um, if we're looking at it from how they're moving um, down, so the position for from um, getting into that neutral spine at the start of the, the squat position, um and it's probably linked to a flexibility around their pelvic area um uh in terms of how we can support them to do that but again um thinking about the the um broom broom handle that i was talking about earlier so it may be that they want to work on their hip hinge prior to um working on their actual squatting so that the two combined can link up quite well together in getting their their position body position right brilliant thank you rachel um we'll we'll leave the questioning uh, there as we have sort of uh, gone just over our hour there if there are any questions that we haven't answered we'll have a look through all the comments there's been an awful lot of comments tonight which is really great to see uh, that interaction um but we'll try and answer as many as we can and we'll upload those on a on a on a on a pdf up onto the website where you can sign up for the webinars um once again thank you rachel uh for doing present tonight, presentation tonight i think that's been really helpful and we've got a, a few messages of thanks coming to you on the questions as well for you um just so uh, everybody knows, the video of this presentation, as well as the presentation slides as well, and any questions and answers that I just mentioned, will go up onto the uh, webinar page on the British Rowing website. Um,
Please keep checking out for any future webinars we have coming up. As we've mentioned several times tonight, the session on Thursday, so tips for improving hip mobility, follows on uh, from th this session specifically. So you'll be able to learn how to improve some of these things if you're finding there's, there's problems with some of your athletes. Um, next week, we have on Tuesday, Lockdown Life with uh, some of our GB rowers. So we have uh, Elliot, Eleanor Piggott, um, Matt Rossiter and George Rossiter on that with our host Camilla Hadland who is a well growing uh, commentator who will be doing a presentation for that so we really recommend some of your athletes come along to, to that one as well so please share that amongst your squads amongst your athletes we'd like to see as many uh, come along to that presentation as well we hope um, that your, your athletes will be able to relate and see how the, the GB rows are going through with their uh, with their training and their emotions at the moment so what we want you to we want to help make your athletes feel that they're not alone in their, their current situation um the the session next thursday as well we've got our stewards coaches um doing a session on creative training ideas at home so hopefully there's, there's there's been one or two questions about some good ideas for exercises you can do at home on the webinar so hopefully you'll find some uh, good ideas with that as well um so that's everything uh, again thank you rachel thank you everybody for for coming to the webinar if you uh, if you have enjoyed it we'll be sending an email tomorrow with uh, a feedback form on it it's great to hear your feedback there is also a form on the on the page for you to suggest webinars uh, that you'd like to see as well um, but apart from that thank you um, and we'll see you on the next webinar thanks everybody